Mr. President, when you took your oath of office, I sent a message online and millions of Americans saw it. In that message, I asked this question. How can you place your left hand on the Bible, the Word of God, and with your right hand sign laws into existence that war against the Word of God? I said, you plan to enact laws that will disregard the distinction between male and female, doing that which our first president warned against, that if we ever disregard the eternal rules of God, his blessings will be removed from the land. And now you've done it. In December 2022, you stood on the White House lawn and officiated over a ceremony in which you signed an act that altered American federal law. When George Orwell wrote his book, 1984, he spoke of a government that used words to obscure and obliterate reality, the ministry of truth to obscure lies, the ministry of love to obscure oppression. What you did, Mr. President, on the White House lawn when you signed that act was that very thing the Respect for Marriage Act, a law that was the very opposite of its name, the disrespecting and obliteration of what marriage has always been since the beginning of human history. You did something that no president had ever done. You enshrined the alteration of marriage into federal law. And you not only did that, but you commemorated it with a great festival inviting thousands of activists and drag queens to the White House lawn to celebrate it with songs and music. You converted the White House into a rainbow. Now listen to the words of an American leader spoken in modern times not long ago, years after 9-11. He declared as absolute moral reality, marriage is between a man and a woman. Who said that? His name was Joe Biden. You said that. And you repeated it for emphasis. Marriage, you said again, is between a man and a woman and states must respect that. And yet now, on the White House lawn, you signed a law that declared that marriage is not between a man and a woman, but between anyone. It was the destruction of the very moral foundation that you declared was absolute. You signed into law an act which by force of law compels all states to disrespect the very thing that you said all states must respect, that marriage is between a man and a woman. Further, you boasted that you voted for the Defense of Marriage Act because it was morally right. You assured America that there was no danger to that law, no violation of it, and no challenge to it. And yet now on the White House lawn, it was your own hand that struck down that very law and destroyed it. How does that happen? How does a man turn away from and against his own morality and actually celebrate the act of turning away and against it? Was there any scientific discovery that changed everything? Was there a new set of tablets handed down on Mount Sinai? Do the words of scripture magically disappear? What do we call it when one abandons one's own values and moral foundations and destroys them and then celebrates it with music, color, and song? When you placed your hand on the word of God, the Bible, to become president, I asked you this, how do you sign into law that which clearly wars against the very word on which you swore your oath? And now you've done it. You've set American federal law at war against the word of God and against everyone who upholds it. And that same word of God in the book of Isaiah says that those who call what is sinful good will end up calling that and those who are good sinful and evil. And on the White House law, you prove those words true. You merge together and equated racism and anti-Semitism with what you called homophobia and transphobia. And in that context in which you said it, it meant that all who do not and cannot condone same-sex marriage, and all who believe that to hormonally and surgically alter a child is morally and egregiously wrong, all who believe the word of God are now the equivalent of racists and anti-Semites. So was the president under whom you served Barack Obama, who first ran for office stating that marriage was between a man and a woman because of God, was he the equivalent of a racist and an anti-Semite? 
was Abraham Lincoln who believed the very same thing, the equivalent of a racist and an anti-Semite? Was Mother Teresa the equivalent of a racist and an anti-Semite? Was just about every American until just recently, in effect, a racist and an anti-Semite? Is every person of faith who believes in the word of God now equivalent to a racist and an anti-Semite? Was the senator who publicly declared that marriage was between a man and a woman, were you a racist and an anti-Semite? The American government is opposed to racist and anti-Semites. So does this mean that you are now setting the American government against Christians and those of faith? It's a very relevant question. You see, when you became president, I asked you, how can you place one hand on the word that ordains human life as sacred and in the image of God from conception, and then with the other sign laws into existence that will promulgate the killing of that human life? Mr. President, you once stood for life and for the most defenseless against the killing of the unborn through abortion. And yet now you have advocated for the most radical expansion of the killing of unborn children in American history. And you've employed the Department of Justice as a weapon to be wielded against those who now seek to protect unborn children. So I ask you again, are you setting the United States government against Christians, against those who uphold the word of God? You see, in order for the Respect for Marriage Act to pass, its authors were forced to put in a clause by which houses of worship and religious organizations would not be forced to act against their faith to perform and recognize marriages that defy the word of God. But a news reporter then asked your press secretary if that clause of religious freedom was not discrimination. In other words, shouldn't we remove that clause so that houses of worship will be forced to act against their faith and God? We would have expected your press secretary being politically adept to have restated the inviolable nature of religious freedom and conscience or to have changed the subject and moved on. But she didn't. She did something else. She said, quote, is there more work to do? Absolutely. Her answer to that implicit call for the future revoking of religious freedom and the compelling of believers to act against their faith was yes, 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 there is more work to do. Now the White House press secretary is carefully instructed to answer according to the president's wishes. So Mr. President, do you agree with your own press secretary? At the beginning of your term, I warned of what you are now doing. So now I ask you, will you be working toward the elimination of the protections with regard to religious freedom and conscience? You have already sought to force religious organizations to fund procedures that violate their faith. So will you, with more work to do, work toward forcing churches and Christians to go against their own faith, to partake in what the Bible calls sin, or else be punished by the state, as being, in your own words, now the equivalent of racist and anti-Semites? Do you remember the stories you heard and the movies you watched when you were a child about the first Christians in Rome, how they went to their deaths before lions in the ancient arenas? Why did they go to their deaths? They went to their deaths because the government, the state, was seeking to force them to go against their faith, to burn incense to the emperor, to bow down before other gods, and they would not. So they gave up their lives. You have called yourself a Christian, but how can you in reality be a Christian if you wage war against the ways and the word of God? Your actions are not that of Peter and Paul, but of those who persecuted them and put them to death, the rulers of state, the Diocletians and the Neros. You have fallen away from the stand which you once upheld. In Greek, the word for that is apo, to move away from, and stasis, one state or stand apostasis, or in English, apostasy. The Bible says that in the last days there will be a great apostasy, a great falling away from faith. And thus we will see a Christian-based civilization and nations falling into apostasy. We would then expect that the leaders of such nations will themselves be fallen into apostasy and thus will embody that apostasy. Have you not become the embodiment of that apostasy. We are now there. And you, Mr. President, 
are there as well in a state of apostasy. And for one who calls oneself a Christian, it is a most dangerous state to be in because eternity is very near. It is for all of us just one heartbeat away. For now, you have a position, an administration, a government, a party, a media. But the day will come when you will stand before God and you will have no more position, no administration, no government, no media, and no public opinion. They will all be gone. It will just be you and him. And he will ask you to give account of what you did, what you did with regard to his word and his ways, and what you did with regard to your own stands that you knew were right. And without salvation and the new birth, there awaits only an eternity without God and of eternal judgment. Judgment will come. And yet God calls to all and to all stretches out his arms. The only hope America has and each of us have is to turn, to repent, and to come under his mercy and into those arms. Mr. President, the hour is late and eternity is soon coming. Repent and turn to God. For the only hope America has is revival. And the only hope you have and all of us have is salvation. In Hebrew, the word for salvation is Yeshua. Yeshua in English is the name Jesus. Apart from him, from Yeshua, from Jesus, there is no salvation. And in him alone is their hope. May God have mercy on America. And may God have mercy on you, Mr. President, and upon us all.